Hi guys, uh, I'm Dr. Zainab Bora and uh, in this video we are going to be discussing about the imaging of cella. So this is a topic which is very very important and you do get a lot of questions from this uh, as far as the theory is concerned and this also comes as, as the long case and I remember that I got a paracellar mass in, in my own uh, MD exit exam. So it, it is an important long case you know if you have a neuro a uh, faculty or an examiner who's coming, it is almost certain that one of the long cases is going to be on a cell or paracellar mass. So it's very, very important that you know the approach here and that's the systematic approach that we're going to learn, all right? So let's begin with some anatomy here. So you know that cella here is housed in the middle cranial fossa. It's a small uh, uh, fossa which is called as cella torsica which literally means a Turkish saddle, you know. So when you look at uh, the, the shape here, it looks like the saddle of a Turkish horse. So the boundaries here, so anteriorly we can see is bound by the tuberculum cellae and posteriorly we have the dorsum cellae. So those are the two boundaries between which is the depression that is cella tersica and anteriorly you can see that these are both the anterior clinoid processes and posteriorly we do have the posterior clinoid processes, right? So this is where the cella is in between the, the lesser wing and the greater wing of sphenoid. Again, looking at it from the sagittal plane or the lateral view here, so you can see that this is our cella torsica. Anteriorly, the anterior wall, very, very important, the anterior wall is called tuberculum cella and the posterior wall is called dorsum cellae. So this is something you need to know uh, because this is how on a radiograph or a CT, we are going to see the bony landmarks, right? On the MRI, obviously, the focus is not on the cella, but the pituitary. But on CT, on X-ray, all we can see is the, the bony cella and then from there we take it, um, you know, we extend it and extrapolate the findings. The, the bone of sphenoid which you see here is the planum sphenoidal and there's a small sulcus which is called as the chiasmatic sulcus anteriorly and we already saw the anterior and the posterior clinoid processes and below it lies the sphenoid sinus. So, in our PNS imaging class, we've already talked about how the sphenoid sinus pneumatization is with respect to the cella, where we know that whether it is pre-cellar, cellar or post-cellar is what we have already seen here, right? So this is about the gross anatomy. Even though we don't really use x-rays for imaging of cella anymore, but a few things you need to know first is what are the normal dimensions so that if there is a macro adenoma or there's a cellar enlargement, we need to know what the cutoff is. So this is something that you just need to have a, a ballpark figure in your mind. So the height of cella, which is normal, is 12 mm and the AP diameter is 16. So 12 and 16 are two numbers to keep in mind. Apart from that, what we can see here in this image yeah. So what is this? The very, very famous potter gets asked a lot. So what you can see here is a J-shaped cella. We can see that the dorsum cella, how the J-shape is formed here is that the dorsum cellae is maintained as it is. But the tuberculum cellae, instead of forming here, gets flattened. Yeah. So this is what gives the name of a J-shaped cella and what are the different causes will be the next question here. So obviously the first important thing is that it may be a normal variant seen in 5% population. Then what are the pathophysiologies? It can be seen in an optic chiasma glioma because that is what will compress on the anterior tuberculum cellae. Then we can have neurofibromatosis, NF1, we can have achondroplasia and MPS. These are two uh, very common causes which may be associated. And then chronic hydrocephalus. So these are the causes of a J-shaped cella, which is a very, very important spotter, right? Moving on to how do we do the MRI? So MRI is going to be our workhorse here. It's something which we will do in every suspected case of a cellar, paracellar, supracellar, mass lesion. How do we plan the MRI of cella is something that you should know as residents as well. So we have to acquire thin sections. And we take a small FOV so that the SNR here is better. Now, look at this. So, the first thing you will do is screen the brain with an axial flare. And then we take a sagittal MRI. It's on the sagittal that we plan the sequences. So, you can see 
that sagittal is the planning sequence you localize the infundibulum and it's along the infundibulum that the cellar cuts are planned right so it's the infundibulum along which we will take the coronal cuts along this plane and then perpendicular to this plane will be the axial cuts so this is how you plan the sequence apart from that we are going to take sagittal coronal as the main sequence axial is something which is not very very important in cella not even done right so what you need to remember T2 sagittal as the planning sequence, the coronal are oblique along the infundibulum and then we have sagittal cuts which are planned, right? So, apart from this, what is very, very important is we take dynamic coronal images. So, how do we acquire? So, we take three planes. As you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six planes. Out of this, the central three planes are what are planned. So, consecutive sets of three in coronal plane every 10 seconds for two minutes. So, for two minutes, the dynamic scan is done every 10 seconds. So, this is how the dynamic contrast images are planned and we also acquire a routine post-contrast sagin core. Why this is very important is what I'll talk about and this is something that you will do not in all cases of uh, cellular masses. This is only when you are suspecting a microadenoma. Right. So this is only in case of microadenoma, a dynamic contrast is not needed if you have a macroadenoma or a supracellular mass. So this is not routine. It's only for microadenoma and I'll tell you why. But before that, some anatomy here, which is very, very important. So this is a T1 weighted sagittal MRI that we are seeing. How do I know? Always look at the posterior pituitary, right? So you can see that this is the pituitary gland. This is the anterior pituitary, which is hypo-intense to iso-intense. Whereas this here is the posterior pituitary hotspot. So why the posterior pituitary appears hyper-intense or as a hotspot on T1-weighted images? Because it is made up of these neurosecretory granules. So, what posterior pituitary does is it does not synthesize its own hormones. It's going to take the hormones produced by the hypothalamus and it's just going to store them. So, because it's storing these neurosecretory granules, that gives it the T1 hyperintensity here. Okay. So, this is the pituitary. What you see here is the infundibulum or the pituitary stock. Then you see anteriorly this bulbous projection here is the optic chiasma. Then you see this part here, which is tuber cinarium, a part of hypothalamus. And then these are mammillary bodies, which are the anterior part of the midbrain. And this is the pons here. All right. So this is what is the anatomy here. Apart from that, we have a thin septum, which is the lamina terminalis. And we also have the cisterna lamina terminalis right here. And this is the anterior commissure. And this is the posterior commissure. You know how in axial brain, we take a section passing through. And this is how our axial sections are passed much, much neater. So a line connecting anterior and posterior commissure is how the axial sections are planned. So you need to know where they are located. So you can see that this is the posterior commissure, this is anterior commissure, this is where the pineal gland is, right? So this is about the anatomy here, very, very important. Anatomy on the corresponding coronal images now. So pretty simple again. So you can see that this here is our pituitary. This is the infundibular stock. So, this is the pituitary. This is the infundibular stock. These are post-contrast images, right? So, these are post-contrast. This is the infundibular stock and this is the optic chiasma. Optic chiasma. What you see on the two sides of the pituitary are the paired cavernous sinuses. So, these are the paired cavernous sinuses that we can see here. Now, what are the contents of the cavernous sinus? Very, very important. There are two contents of the cavernous sinus. You can see here the flow void corresponds to the cavernous segment of the ICA. And then you see that there is a nerve here. What is this nerve? This is the sixth cranial nerve. So there are two contents here. And then in the lateral wall lies the other nerves that you don't really see very well in this image. But, you know, you may see them in very, very high resolution thin section images. In this post contrast, you're not able to see the uh, three uh, nerves which lie in the lateral wall, but you can see one of them. So the three nerves which are there in the lateral wall will be the third, fourth and V1, right? So we have the three cranial nerves here which are located along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, right? So this is what we need to know here.
so now moving on to some anatomy again uh, some words on the anatomy what we have already discussed so anterior lobe we saw is iso intense to the gray matter posterior lobe is the hot spot on t1 and 20% normal patients lack the hot spot so this is important that it may not be seen in around 20% of normal population now let's talk about post contrast images very very important pattern here so what you need to remember is that the pituitary does not have the blood brain barrier yeah pituitary lacks the blood brain barrier and that is why what is going to happen is as soon as you give the gadolinium there is homogeneous intense enhancement so the gland and the stalk and the median eminence will enhance as you can see the optic chiasma does not enhance but the stalk and the pituitary enhance and obviously this is going to be lesser than the cavernous sinus right so that's the reference here you have two references you know, it is obviously more enhancing than chiasma, but less enhancing than the sinuses themselves. So, now, how the pattern of enhancement is, is first the stalk enhances and then it goes out towards from it. So, the pattern of enhancement is centrifugal and this comes as MCQ in, in you know, entrances. So, this you want to know that the enhancement of pituitary is centrifugal in nature. Now, let's talk about the timeline here. So, the normal gland, the peak enhancement is pretty early, you know, 30 to one, 30 seconds to 1 minute is when it enhances. Now, let's talk about why am I doing dynamic in the microadenoma. Microadenomas are adenomas less than 10 millimeters. So, you know, sometimes they may be so small that they have absolutely no effect. They can be completely iso-intense to the gland. So, normally we would see some sort of contour bulge, but sometimes even that might not be there. So, now I only need to rely on the differential enhancement of the gland and the adenoma to diagnose it. So, how does that work? So, the adenoma, as you can see, has a slow progressive enhancement, which is starting or which ranges around 60 to 200 seconds. So, you can see any ways that the peak of the adenoma is going to be later than the normal gland. So, when my normal gland is maximally enhanced, I'm going to see this adenoma as a hypo-intense dot or as a hypo-intense small lesion within the cella. Did you understand this? So, this is how we are going to pick up a microadenoma on dynamic and this is the concept and if you can draw this graph in a question, that will be great, you know. So, this is what is the concept behind it. Having said that, now let's go about a pattern-based approach before